This is it. This is our closing keynote for the Vice Presidency Conference. I'm so glad that you all were able to be a participant to this. Uh, this man needs really no introduction. Every, um, Richard Norton Smith has been a, a leader in terms of putting together presidential libraries. He has worked at the Eisenhower, the, uh, the Hoover, Reagan, um, the Ford, and uh, he also was the inaugural director for the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library Museum too, and he is a great historian. His books on Nelson Rockefeller and most recently Gerald R. Ford um, are just a, a couple of the, those that he has um, published, and so we are we are grateful that he has agreed to close out our conference and talk a little bit more about the vice presidency and board. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, you might say I survived the Abraham Lincoln uh, Presidential Library. If you know anything about Illinois government, uh, I learned Success in Illinois is measured as getting out before the indictments uh, arrive. And uh, I managed the trick, which is more than a couple governors uh, could say. Anyway, I am delighted uh, to see you all, and thank you for coming out on this gorgeous September day in West Michigan. This is why people live in West Michigan. And of course, we, we pay for this come February, March, April. But in any event, this side of the daily Jeopardy Daily Double, it's a safe bet that few Americans are familiar with George Clinton, fourth vice president of the United States. Yet Clinton spoke for most, if not all, of his 45 successors when he complained about the long-winded speeches he was forced to endure while presiding over the United States Senate. It was a fair criticism two centuries ago, and it is one I have taken into account in preparing these remarks. Uh, I, I do want to begin by thanking the Ford Museum and the Foundation, Brooke and all of her staff, um, for all the work that goes into a program like that. I know a lot of work goes into a program like this. I also want to thank the participants um, for sharing their memories and their insights. My role this afternoon might be likened to that of a cleanup hitter, uh, distilling some themes from the last couple of days before taking a deeper dive into what Gerald Ford, with characteristic candor, uh, called the worst job of his life. For nearly all of the 19th century and much of the 20th, vice presidents were chosen first and foremost to balance a party's ticket, usually at the last minute amid the heat and hard feelings of an exhausted political convention with little or no vetting and even less consideration of how a victorious team might advance a common agenda once in office. Opposites are said to attract. On paper, it makes sense to broaden the ticket's appeal through contrasting elements of age, experience, geography, and ideology. In practice, however, the results have often bordered on the disastrous. Case in point, John Tyler. Do we have any Virginians? Well, <laughs> forgive me, <laughs> but we, John Tyler has a lot to ask us to forgive. Uh, Tyler was, a, of course, a Virginian and a states' rights Democrat who joined the anti-Jackson Whig Party ticket in 1840 to form the other half of Tippecanoe and Tyler II. No one planned on Tippecanoe, William Henry Harrison, dying after one month in office. When he did, Tyler faced a conundrum. Exactly what was his status? The Constitution provided scant guidance. Its interpretation was left to Tyler, who never doubted for a moment he was President of the United States, not acting President, but President with all the powers and prerogatives of the office. These included pursuing policies, including the annexation of Texas and the veto of a national bank that were anathema to the party that nominated him, a mistake it had no intention of repeating in 
1844. Vastly greater was the damage, indeed it could be argued damage that we are still recovering from, that resulted from the selection 20 years later of Andrew Johnson, a Tennessean of pro-union sympathies whose presence on the ticket, the Union Party ticket, was thought to strengthen Abraham Lincoln's appeal to war Democrats. With Lincoln's assassination in April 1865, everything won on the battlefield through northern heroics was suddenly, brutally put at risk. Slavery may have ended with the 13th Amendment, but Johnson's unapologetic embrace of white supremacy, like his stubborn insistence on restoration instead of reconstruction, set back the cause of racial equality in this country for 100 years, until another President Johnson, also a son of the South, embraced civil and voting rights legislation in tribute to his murdered predecessor. What might be described as the modern era of the vice presidency began one night in September 1952, after the New York Post accused 39-year-old Senator Richard Nixon of keeping a secret fund replenished by wealthy campaign contributors to supplement the meager congressional allowance for travel, postage, and other means of communicating with the nation state that is California, Nixon took to the airwaves to salvage his place on the ticket. It is a commonplace to observe that John F. Kennedy was the first television president. I would argue that Richard Nixon beat him to the punch by about eight years. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is what became famous, infamous in some quarters, uh, as the checker speech overnight did something for Nixon that no other vice president at that stage of his career could claim. Uh, overnight, he had a constituency in the millions. It was the first draft of what he would later in another iteration called the silent majority. Um, and it became fashionable in some quarters to laugh at Pat Nixon's Republican cloth coat. But the fact of the matter is, in one speech, Richard Nixon stole uh, FDR's forgotten man. Uh, and you could even argue that it was a transformative event. We couldn't know it then. But it really contributed in a significant way it seems to me, uh, to the post-New Deal evolution of American politics. Uh, technology came to Nixon's aid again. The jet plane enabled him um, to circle the globe and gain visibility as Dwight Eisenhower's representative at the height of the Cold War. And of course, Ike's several bouts with illness uh, turned the spotlight on Nixon in the way that uh, most vice presidents were not accustomed. Starting with Nixon, every vice president has been considered a potential president. Few, if any, have escaped the traditional, mostly good-natured derision that goes with a job, from the Gershwin's immortal Alexander P. Throttlebottom to Dan Quayle's run-in with Murphy Brown and Saturday Night Live's takeoff on Al Gore's eye-rolling debate preparation. The one exception may have been Walter Mondale, um, he who possessed what I call Norwegian charisma. Um, and, and Mondale would have been the first to, to laugh at that. Uh, you've heard it more than once over the last couple of days. By common uh, consensus, uh, Walter Mondale is the first postmodern vice president, the first to have his own office in the West Wing, the first to reside in the vice presidential re residence at one observatory circle, in effect, arguably the first deputy president. Uh, I once had the pleasure of interviewing uh, Vice President Mondale, who was very explicit, and he told me that it was his firsthand knowledge of the humiliation that his friend and mentor Hubert Humphrey had experienced at Lyndon Johnson's hands that led him to propose slash insist on a very different kind of vice presidency. Uh, he would not be fobbed off with oversight of the space program or other projects that 
were the equivalent of vice presidential make work. Instead, Mondale would be Jimmy Carter's chief advisor and link to Capitol Hill, where he was instrumental in securing Senate passage of the Panama Canal treaties. He was simultaneously a White House emissary to organize labor and other more liberal elements of the Democratic Party. In politics, as in real estate, it's all about location, location, location. And more often than not, Mondale was the last person in the room before a presidential decision was made or policy determined. The same might be said of Al Gore, Dick Cheney, or Joe Biden. Breaking with tradition, the Clinton-Gore ticket offered none of the obvious contrast that had once governed the vice presidential selection process. The two men came from neighboring states. They were of the same generation and political outlook. West New Deal, then Democratic Leadership Council. By the same token, Dick Cheney certainly wasn't asked to run with George W. Bush because of his swing state appeal. Wyoming's electoral votes, all three of them, were safely ensconced in the Republican column, whoever ran for vice president. Cheney's uniquely powerful position in the second Bush presidency reflected the president's trust and confidence in a vice president who had no desire to succeed him. A rare example of self-denial that reinforced both Cheney's loyalty and, paradoxically, his independence. Which brings us to the vice president that Dick Cheney knows best. Gerald Ford was chosen for the job under duress. During his eight months in office, Ford would have his loyalty severely tested. In the end, however, I would argue it was his independence that established Ford's credibility as the nation's 38th president. It certainly did not hurt that he was anything but Richard Nixon's first choice to replace Spiro Agnew after Agnew implicated in kickback politics as governor of Maryland resigned in order to avoid possible jail time. Nixon's preference was for John Connolly, the swaggering Texan whose recent conversion to the GOP made him persona non grata among the Democratic majorities on Capitol Hill. Only now, 50 years after the fact, has it come to light that Ford was, in fact, aware of Agnew's legal troubles at least six months earlier than he ever went on publicly, or as far as I can tell, privately. Denied his long-standing ambition to be Speaker of the House, Ford reasoned there were worse ways to round out nearly three decades in Washington than as Agnew's replacement. In fact, this was not the first time that Gerald Ford had set his cap for the vice presidency. Uh, in 1960, with a dozen years of House service under his belt, he'd been a dark horse contender to join his friend Richard Nixon on that year's GOP ticket. Uh, in the end, uh, his role was confined to a uh, seconding speech for Henry Cabot Lodge, uh, a candidate whose credentials for the office exceeded his campaign work trail ethic. Um, Lodge makes me pause for just a moment. Um, I think 1960 is unique. Every four years, when uh, journalists run out of things to write about, speculating about the horse race and the primaries and fundraising, um, invariably the ter talk turns to speculation about who might be on the ticket. And invariably, after every election, there's a consensus that it didn't really matter who was running for vice president. People don't vote for the vice presidency. 99% of the time, that's true. It's not, in my opinion, true in 1960. In fact, 1960 is double unique because I think it's the one year when both candidates contributed, one positively and one negatively, to the outcome. Um, I think it's not hard to argue that if Lyndon Johnson had not been on the ticket the Roman Catholic candidate, John F. Kennedy, would not have carried Texas, which he barely carried. Uh, and there are several other southern states. South Carolina comes to mind. In other words, I think Lyndon Johnson provided the margin of victory for JFK. On the other side of the fence, I think Henry Cabot Lodge, estimable uh, a human being that he was, excellent 
UN ambassador, et cetera, et cetera. Remember, one reason why Lodge was on the ticket was because of television. Television had covered his performance at the UN, where he was seen as a strong anti-communist. Um, and moreover, Eisenhower wanted him on the ticket. And that carried a lot of weight in any event. The problem was he was a lazy candidate. Ford said privately, much, much later on, he said, forget about my qualifications. He said, I would have been a hell of a better candidate than Lodge. And I think probably most people would agree. Lodge um, was the, the last sort of patrician Yankee. Um, he um, had a habit every afternoon of taking a nap in the middle of the day, uh, but not before he had a, a can of skinned Portuguese sardines. Um, most candidates would have used that time to be out pressing the flesh or raising money or being interviewed, um, not Lodge. But, but more to the point, Lodge is something in retrospect which is very admirable, but which I think contributed to Nixon's, one more reason why Nixon didn't carry South Carolina or Texas. Henry Cabot Lodge in Harlem said, again, very consistent with his views, quite frankly, consistent with Nixon's performance as vice president. Uh, he promised that there would be an African-American in the cabinet. And in 1960, uh, in parts of the South, uh, that was not an argument that won you, won you votes. So fast forward 13 years, 1973, there's a Agnews just resigned, and uh, John Burns, Republican congressman from Wisconsin, a good friend of Ford's, longtime friend, colleague of Ford's, and of course, Mel Laird uh, from Wisconsin. And Burns approached Ford and said, will you help me out? We're getting a campaign together to, in effect, pressure Nixon to choose Laird. And Ford said no. I uh, said, the, tr the truth is, I'm interested in the job myself. Now, that comes as a surprise to everyone who thinks about good old Jerry, the unam unambitious, you know, genial congressman from, uh, from West Michigan. Uh, one of the things I discovered in researching the book was he was a lot more ambitious than he went on, and he did a really good job of cloaking it. And that is one example. The irony is, at that very moment, Mel Laird was at the White House trying to talk Richard Nixon into dropping Conway, who was unconfirmable, and going with Gerald Ford, who he said could be confirmed in two weeks. And it really is a measure of how politically weakened President Nixon was at that point by the Watergate and the uh, escalating investigations that he really had to um, set aside his first choice his, his view of Ford, it's, it's complicated. They were, they were friends. They were genuinely friends. Um, and he valued Ford's loyalty. In the House, he once said he was the only decent Republican leader. He was thinking of Hugh Scott over in the Senate, who was a Rockefeller Republican, never a Nixon Republican. And so he, he, he had a lot of regard for Ford's uh, political judgment. Um, but he also said to a friend, and I think probably maybe in resentment that he was sort of having this, you know, foisted off on him in some ways. A friend asked him for his opinion, and he, and he, he said Ford was an honest Truman. Now, 50 years on, that's a compliment, <laughs> uh, almost a redundancy. But I somehow don't think that Richard Nixon intended it. As a, as a compliment. In any event, uh, Nixon wasted no time. Agnew resigned on October 10th, two days later, uh, in a somewhat garish, celebratory event uh, in the East Room of the White House uh, before a national television audience with the strolling strings uh, performing. Um, Nixon introduced Gerald Ford as his choice to succeed Agnew. And uh, with that, uh, the, uh, the starting pistol was fired. Um, the FBI undertook the most extensive investigation of, of any candidate for office uh, in history. 350 agents in 33 
field offices made it their business to investigate Ford's finances and friends. Uh, about the worst they came up with was a, a former Ohio State halfback who had been tackled by Ford in his college days. And Ford was penalized for unnecessary roughness. Ironically, the Ohio State player volunteered to the FBI that it was, in fact, a clean hit. Um, almost immediately, if you remember those days, everything accelerated. Um, within days, Ford was engulfed in the Watergate drama. On October 20th, and remember, this is eight days after he's been announced as Nixon's choice for vice president. Uh, that news is superseded by the Saturday Night Massacre, so-called, uh, in which uh, the president fired Watergate special prosecutor Archibald Cox. Um, on the Sunday morning after the Saturday Night Massacre, Gerald Ford's position was transformed. Um, overnight. Henceforth, congressional committees, the media, and a national television audience uh, would be taking his measure not as a caretaker serving out the remainder of Agnew's term, but as a prospective president should Nixon be impeached or resign. At his confirmation hearings, Ford coupled support for Nixon administration policies with veiled criticism of the White House over its handling of the Watergate investigation. When asked about the decision of Attorney General Elliot Richardson and his deputy, William Ruckelshaus, to resign rather than carry out the presidential edict and fire Cox, Ford allowed that, faced with the same set of facts, he would have done the same. He again ruffled White House feathers by insisting his swearing-in take place on Capitol Hill, not in the East Room of the White House, as the uh, Nixon palace guard wanted. Capitol Hill, after all, had been his home for a quarter century. It was still his political base. Caring nothing for the trappings of office, high school bands greeting the new vice president were asked to forego the traditional ruffles and feathers in favor of the University of Michigan fight song. Ford readily ceded to Henry Kissinger use of the four-engine Boeing 707 to which any vice president was entitled. In its place, Ford happily settled for a lumbering twin-engine prop plane, top speed 330 miles an hour, affectionately dubbed Slingshot Airlines by the handful of staff and reporters along for the ride. Ford himself joked that it was the only plane in the Air Force that stopped for red lights. A tug of war ensued. It didn't escape the notice of Ford staffers that they were denied parking passes, and White House mess privileges. Nixon Chief of Staff Alexander Haig made sure to supply the new vice president with speechwriters loyal to Nixon and enthusiastic at proclaiming his innocence in the Watergate break-in and cover-up. They were kept busy. During his four, six months, first six months in office, Vice President Ford covered 80,000 miles, visiting 30 states, and making 375 speeches and other appearances. This was not accidental. Bob Hartman, who was, an, and even now is, something of a polarizing figure in the Ford circle, was much more than Ford speechwriter, or much more even than his senior political advisor. I think he was something of an alter ego. He was the un-Ford. Ford insisted on seeing the good in everyone. Hartman fulfilled a vitally necessary role of imagining the worst about everyone. Um, and together, they harmonized in a, in a political a whole. Anyway, it was Hartman who told Ford, hit the road, stay on the road, put as much distance as you can between this White House, this scandal, uh, because although we don't know how it's going to end, it's probably not going to end well. And it was advice, Ford may very well have reasoned it himself, but in any event, um, he, he stayed on the road. Uh, it cannot, however, be said that he delivered the same message everywhere he went. 
Appearing on NBC's Meet the Press, Ford said he could envision a compromise between the White House and the Senate Watergate Committee over hundreds of presidential tapes being sought by the committee. His comments were immediately disowned by Nixon's spokesman, leaving the vice president to protest unconvincingly. I'm sure the president feels if I have a conviction, I should say it. He doesn't want me to be a rubber stamp. That was Ford who saw the good in everyone. At other times, especially during the shakedown phase of his vice presidency, Ford sounded for all the world like his master's voice. Appearing before the American Farm Bureau Federation in Atlantic City on January 15th, 1974, the vice president accused a small group of political activists of deliberately exploiting Watergate, quote, to cripple the president by dragging out the preliminaries to impeachment for as long as they can and to use the whole affair for maximum political advantage. The blowback was immediate and scorching. At a Grand Rapids reception a few days later, Ford shook hands with hundreds of admirers, many of whom had stood for hours in a numbing cold. Many in the long line echoed the concerns of Cliff Gettings, Ford's high school football coach, who told reporters, we don't think he should get involved in Watergate. In this, he echoed Bob Hartman. Uh, the advice was reinforced by Ford's close friend and former law partner, Phil Buchan, who told the vice president he must not diminish his political value or further divide the country by approaching impeachment as he would a partisan political campaign. It was sound advice, consistent with Ford's own conciliatory nature. Unlike his predecessor or the president to whom he now reported, Gerald Ford liked reporters, even those with whom he disagreed. One of his favorites was Maggie Hunter of the New York Times. She gave the vice president a copy of George Reedy's The Twilight of the Presidency, a cautionary account warning of presidential isolation amid an expanding and self-important White House staff. Ford read the book cover to cover, then he read it again, before recommending it to key members of his staff, and yet the tug of war intensified. Ford had to walk this terrible tightrope all the time, says Tom DeFrank, the New York Daily News correspondent who was a regular on Slingshot Airlines. Initially, Ford's defense of the president bordered on sycophancy. This reflected a friendship going back 25 years. Quote, but as time went on and as he would learn things, DeFrank continued, I think it slowly began to dawn on Ford that Nixon was lying to him. A White House meeting on January 21st crystallized Ford's doubts. Nixon took the occasion to deny any responsibility for a mysterious 18 and a half minute gap in one of the tapes being sought by the special prosecutor. Pointedly, Ford declined an offer from the president to review selectively edited transcripts that were said to disprove John Dean's claims of presidential complicity. It was all part of his, of his tightrope walk, balancing a spirited public defense of the embattled president against an unspoken obligation to preserve his own credibility in case. Ford refused to discuss the possibility of replacing Nixon. Senior staff understood it was a forbidden subject. So astonishingly, I find it astonishing, did his wife and children. Um, in the summer of 1974, imagine the Fords and Alexander were probably one of the few families in America whose dinner table conversation did not include speculation about the ultimate outcome of the Watergate scandal and investigation. Speaking before the Midwest Republican Leadership Conference at the end of March, the vice president struck a very different note from his slashing polemic in Atlantic City. Addressing a room full of GOP activists, he declined to speculate on what he called the criminal and legal aspects of this sorry episode. And yet one conclusion was unavoidable. Quote, never again, said Ford, must Americans allow an arrogant elite guard of political adolescence like creep <laughs> 
the committee to reelect the president, to bypass the regular party organizations and dictate the terms of a national election. For Ford, it was a liberating moment. Henceforth, he would rely on speechwriters of his choosing. At a White House meeting on May 23rd, he questioned the administration's refusal to comply with the congressional subpoena. It's a bad call, Mr. President, he told Nixon, and it complicates the whole situation by undercutting the president's support on Capitol Hill and sowing fresh doubts among the public and press. Throughout that summer and into that spring and into the summer months, Ford maintained his zigzag course, deftly, if not always gracefully, navigating between extremes. He insisted that nothing in Nixon's conduct justified his removal from office. Yet this seemed grudging to some Nixon loyalists, none more fervent than New Hampshire's famously abusive Manchester Union leader, which assured its readers with characteristic subtlety, Jerry is a jerk. Nixon himself was forced to deny to his vice president a Newsweek story that he had welcomed Nelson Rockefeller to the Oval Office by pointing to the chair behind his desk and asking Rocky, can you see Jerry Ford sitting in this chair? By the way, I don't know that Nixon said it. If he did, he wasn't putting down Ford. He was buttering up Nelson Rockefeller. As Washington basked in the summer heat, again, the conversation everywhere but uh, on Crown Drive in Alexandria uh, turned to speculation about Gerald Ford's future. Appearing on William F. Buckley's firing line on June 28th, Ford maintained that there were, at that time, insufficient votes in the House to impeach the president. But what Buckley pressed him, what if Nixon were to defy a Supreme Court decision requiring him to yield his tapes to the special prosecutor? Then Ford replied, it's a totally different ball game. It then becomes an institutional conflict. Responding to reporters' inquiries, the vice president went out of his way to reject White House Press Secretary Ron Ziegler's characterization of the House Judiciary Committee as a kangaroo court. Away from the cameras, his feelings were deeply conflicted. In mid-July, Ford returned briefly to Grand Rapids, where he met privately with an unofficial kitchen cabinet that included Bill Gill, news director of Wood TV. I have a feeling that he's going to be impeached, the vice president confided to this trusted group. I just don't know what to do. I'm supporting him, yet I wonder where we're going with this thing. You've got to back off, Gill responded. You've got to maintain your credibility, or you won't be able to handle it once you become president. But nobody else will support him, Ford protested. Nobody else is behind him. Doesn't that tell you something, Gill replied? The story that I think sums up better than anything Ford's uniquely equivocal position. On July 9th, the former Chief Justice of the United States, Earl Warren, died. Now, Ford and Warren had had a rocky relationship, including their time on the Warren Commission a decade earlier. Um, Warren did not know, and indeed no one else knew, that Ford was writing an article uh, for Life magazine, a behind-the-scenes description of the commission. Worse, uh, he had contracted to co-author a book, a portrait of Lee Harvey Oswald, that basically relied on transcripts that the commission had, uh, had assembled. In any event, um, the morning that Warren died, uh, he was to be honored by lying in state, as is now traditional, up at the Supreme Court building on Capitol Hill. And a Ford staffer said to the vice president, you know, it would really be a nice gesture for you to go up and pay your respects. And Ford thought about it. And he said, you know, the White House would not be happy with that. And, you know, end of, end of discussion. Well, the staff learned later in the day that on his own, Ford had thought it over, and he decided to do the decent thing. And he went up to the Supreme Court and uh, 
prayed in front of the Chief Justice's casket. And sure enough, the White House was not happy. But the fact that July 9th, that date, is significant. That's exactly one month before Ford was sworn in. By then, it's pretty clear that power had flowed away from the president to the vice president, who was emboldened to pay his very public respects to Earl Warren, a man for whom Richard Nixon had very little use, politically or personally. Shortly after 9 o'clock in the morning of August 1st, Al Haig appeared in the vice president's office in the old executive office building for what he intended to be a private conversation. To his dismay, he found himself sharing a sofa with Ford speechwriter Bob Hartman, whose distrust of the general was returned with compound interest. Mindful of Hartman's reputation as a leaker, Haig was less forthcoming than he might have been. Things were deteriorating, he told Ford. There are some new developments that will dramatically change circumstances affecting the president. Ford said he'd like to talk with Nixon lawyer James St. Clair. He asked Haig, how's the president holding up? His mood was volatile, said Haig, veering between fierce resistance and a curious passivity. Books have been written and will continue to be written. Debates will be held. We may never have the final word on the burning question, what exactly was Al Haig up to in the first week of August? I have my own theory, free to accept it or reject it. I think Haig had decided for a number of reasons that it was in the country's interest for Richard Nixon to leave office. But for him to do so with as little tumult or public resistance uh, as possible. I further think that Haig's approach to Ford was part of a much larger campaign, surreptitious necessarily, to enlist a number of people who Nixon might listen to so that Haig wasn't bearing the burden entirely himself. One obviously was the vice president. And by the way, when Ford declined Haig's uh, invitation on the 1st of August to weigh in with the president. Haig did something very characteristic uh, without telling anyone. He dialed Bob Griffin, senator from Michigan, he was deputy Republican leader of the Senate, Gerald Ford's closest friend in the Senate. And without spilling all of his guts, he made it very clear much more detailed fashion than he had with Ford, the nature of the forthcoming evidence, which we all know now as the smoking gun tapes. And in effect, asked Griffin if he could lean in a little and weigh in. And that's exactly what Griffin did. Griffin went back to his home in Traverse City that night, Friday night, sleepless night. In the morning, he dictated a letter to the president to be hand-delivered to Nixon later that day, in which he said basically that if the president defied a court subpoena to turn over the tapes, then he would regard that as an impeachable offense and he would vote accordingly. Well, Nixon went through the roof, as you might imagine. And then Haig, being Haig, the ultimate courtier, some would say serpentine, some would say worse. But Haig uh, took it the occasion to suggest to the president that Griffin probably was put up to this by someone, probably Jerry Ford's friends. And of course, he was put up to it by Al Haig, which is one reason why when you read Haig's memoirs, and there are more than one of them, uh, you have to read all of them, and you have to read a whole lot more, and you have to bring Bob Hartman-like levels of skepticism, uh, because Haig sometimes contradicts himself. Um, there was a second meeting on the afternoon of August 1st. Ford had left the first meeting, the one, remember, that Bob Hartman had sat in on. And as soon as Ford got to his office on the Capitol, the phone rang. It was Al Haig calling him, I want to see you again alone. And around 3 o'clock that afternoon, 
Haig reappears. And even now, Haig is convinced that uh, Hartman is hiding behind a decorative screen in the office. Well, he wasn't. But that does begin to suggest the levels of paranoia. By the way, it was an equal opportunity paranoia. Bob Hartman was so convinced that the vice presidential offices were bugged that any meeting of any significance that he had or any kind of confidential information that he was passing, he always made sure to do it in the hallway and not in his office or the vice president's office. Welcome to the concluding days of the Nixon presidency. Um, in any event, at this second meeting, Haig was much more explicit. Um, basically, that Richard Nixon had known on June 23rd um, the whole story of uh, the break-in and indeed participating uh, in, in the cover-up. Uh, that was a day, as you recall, that, that Nixon told Haldeman uh, to have the FBI go to the CIA and turn off any investigation. Um, uh, or, or, no, no, I'm sorry, the other way around. It's been almost 50 years. But the fact of the matter is he wanted the, he wanted the FBI and CIA investigations turned off on the uh, excuse of national security. Um, Nixon had known that this tape existed since the previous May. He had not allowed anyone to hear the tape, including James St. Clair, his, his high-priced Boston lawyer. Um, he misled his family. He misled his staff. And at this point, Haig pretty much had had it. And um, there was an unmistakable formality in this second um, almost handing of the baton exchange. Haig says, are you ready, Mr. Vice President, to assume the presidency in a short period of time? If it happens, Al, I'm prepared. Haig could not say with any degree of assurance what the next few days might bring. Only the day before, Nixon had dismissed the June 23rd tape as manageable, his word. His subsequent change of heart might yet be reversed, as it was, due to family pressure to stay or outside pressure to go, a la Bob Griffin and his letter. Clutching two pieces of paper, disregarding Ford's earlier refusal to involve himself in Nixon's decision-making, Haig raised the treacherous subject of presidential options. These were necessarily limited. Nixon could do nothing and let the judicial process take its course. He could wage a bitter, protracted campaign to stay in office. He could step aside temporarily under the 25th Amendment and reclaim power depending on the eventual outcome of his case. He could agitate for a less severe punishment, like a formal censure. Alternatively, he could issue pardons for himself and all those accused of Watergate crimes and then quit. Finally, Nixon could resign his office in return, Ford's words, quote, for an agreement that the new president would pardon him. Haig asked Ford to assess the situation. One thing is sure, he quoted the vice president, and that is if anyone tries to tell Dick Nixon to leave, He'll stay and fight it out. That's his nature. Ford might well have stopped there, but he didn't. Reflecting Haig's emphasis on the subject, he sought clarification of the president's pardoning power. Haig cited an unnamed White House lawyer who ascribed to the executive the authority to pardon someone even before criminal action had been taken against him. Quote, I have to think about all these things you've told me, said Ford. This is utterly Ford. Um, you talk to everyone in the presidency. He, he welcomed debate. He, he relished, maybe it was part of his congressional upbringing, having two people go hammer and tongs, presenting different sides. But he almost never made a decision or at least announced a decision on the spot. Invariably, he wanted to sleep on it, reflect on it, weigh it. And this is exactly how he responded to Haig. He said he would need time to talk with Betty, also typical, and with White House lawyer Jim St. Clair, 
whom Ford assumed cor incorrectly, based on what Hague had said, that he was the White House uh, lawyer uh, in question. On that note, the two men shook hands. They agreed to stay in touch. After pledging Bob Hartman to absolute secrecy, Ford described Haig's visit not excluding the various options laid out for his consideration by the chief of staff. The mere mention of the word pardon caused Hartman to explode. Jesus, he exclaimed, what did you tell him? I didn't tell him anything. I told him I needed time to think it over. You what? Distrustful as ever, Hartman guessed this was exactly the desired response as far as Haig was concerned. One did not have to share his suspicions to imagine the long arm of Richard Nixon manipulating the emotions of his loyal to a fault vice president. Hartman told Ford that he, quote, should have taken Haig by the scruff of the neck and the seat of the pants and thrown him the hell out of your office. Ford, still processing the reality that he had steadfastly denied to himself for months that he would almost certainly be president within a matter of days, thought Hartman was overreacting. In any event, he couldn't discuss the matter now. It was almost 4.30. Betty was outside in an official car waiting for him to join her for a tour of the putative vice presidential residence he strongly suspected would never be their home. At the Naval Observatory, Ford feigned interest in paint samples and floor plans for a tortuous three quarters of an hour before fleeing the old house and returning to the EOB to review his upcoming schedule. That evening, he and Betty had a dinner date at the Georgetown home of Washington Star Society reporter Betty Beal. The timing might be inconvenient, to put it mildly, but no more so than his earlier house tour. In the times of my life, the famously outspoken Betty Ford is silent about the eye-opening conversation she and her husband had when they finally were alone in their Alexandria home. She was more explicit in comments she made to Trevor Armbruster, Ford's ghostwriter on his presidential memoirs. Um, Ford and Armbruster racked up 4,000 pages of interview transcripts in the course of preparing um, the, the president's White House memoir. Those have never been publicly uh, opened. But I must say, in the course of my research, I was able to see anything that I asked to. But even more important, Ford, like most politicians, was not particularly introspective. So with Ford's assistance, Trevor Armbruster had a stroke of genius. He went off and conducted interviews with 50 of Ford's closest associates, family members, Mrs. Ford, to in effect take the place of Ford's lack of reflectiveness. Those have all been under seal ever since, um, until I was researching the book and I had access to all of the interviews for people who have since passed away. Those who are still alive, obviously, uh, they remain confidential. It was an extraordinary source of information that had never been available before. And the most extraordinary was this exchange. Um, Mrs. Ford told Armbruster, quote, he came home with the word from General Haig that Nixon would resign if he would pardon him. We discussed it. And I said, you can't do that. And he agreed. And he turned it down, unquote. Her last sentence may well refer to an incident that is still in dispute. As Gary and Betty climbed the stairs to their bedroom late at night, after midnight, the phone rang. It was Haig informing Ford that nothing had changed since they had last talked. In his memoirs, Haig treats the call as a routine courtesy towards someone who might sleep better, knowing he was unlikely to be awakened in the middle of the night by White House operators. Ford himself said as much, albeit with a twist, in his memoir. Quote, I told Al I had talked to Betty and we were prepared, but we couldn't get involved in the decision-making process. The general related a very different story to Bob Woodward in a 1997 interview preserved as part of the Woodward-Bernstein archive housed at the University of Texas. 
According to this version of events, it was Ford, influenced by his discussion with Betty, who placed the post-midnight call to Haig. And what he said was far more assertive than the mildly worded disavowal quoted in A Time to Heal. As recounted by Woodward in Shadow, Five Presidents and the Legacy of Watergate, the exchange was brief and pointed. Al Ford said, our discussion this afternoon, I hope you understand there was no agreement, no, dis no decision, and no deal. Whatever was in fact said, it was sufficiently unnerving for Haig at 2 o'clock in the morning to wake up White House lawyer Fred Bazart, the author of the list of options placed before Ford earlier in the day. God damn it, Haig raged, what did you do to me? Haig pleaded innocence. All we did was give him the options, he sputtered. By then, the Fords had retired for the night, but not before clasping hands and extemporizing a prayer. Jerry concluded, as was his nightly habit, by silently mouthing words from the third chapter of Proverbs, first imparted to him in a Grand Rapids Sunday school half a century earlier. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Nine days later, Ford would repeat the biblical injunction at the start of his East Room inaugural, an eight-minute homily celebrated for his much-quoted assertion that our long national nightmare is over. Much less familiar is the qualifying plea that followed as Ford reminded his audience of a higher power, quote, one who orders not only righteousness but love, not only justice but mercy, concluding with an appeal to his countrymen to restore the golden rule to their politics. Minutes later, he put a bipartisan stamp on his new home by replacing the cabinet room portraits of Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson with Abraham Lincoln and Harry Truman, the latter another vice president from middle America who had assumed the Oval Office amid times of crisis and who made a career out of being underestimated. Even before the sun went down that August 9th, Ford was being asked about a new vice president. He would not keep the country waiting long. On his 11th day in office, he introduced Nelson Rockefeller as his chosen successor. Ford had succeeded with the longtime New York governor with both Richard Nixon in 1960 and Hubert Humphrey in 1968 had failed. Then Rockefeller had spurned their invitations to run for vice president with the blunt rejoinder that he wasn't meant to be standby equipment. He had personally known every vice president since Henry Wallace, Rockefeller went on, all of them unhappy in the job. In time, he would add his own name to the roster of dispirited vice presidents. At his best, he tried to maintain a sense of humor about the experience. Asked to describe his official responsibilities, he explained archly, I go to funerals, I go to earthquakes. If we have learned anything about over the last couple of days, it's the painful truth in Harry Truman's characteristically pungent assessment of most, I emphasize most American vice presidents, as quote, about as youthful as a cow's fifth teat. But that is not all we have learned. Beginning with Richard Nixon 70 years ago and accelerating with Walter Mondale, as he succeeded the unhappy Vice President Rockefeller. This constitutional fifth wheel has been reimagined as the president's understudy, to use Dick Cheney's phrase, a president in waiting, a liaison to Capitol Hill, a diplomatic player, and political wingman or woman. Once Arthur Schwarzenegger told us the vice presidency was a mere resting place for mediocrities. Future historians, I would suggest, are unlikely to consign Kamala Harris, Mike Pence, Al Gore, or Dick Cheney to the dreary ranks 
of William Wheeler, Daniel Tompkins, James Sherman, or Skyler Colfax. When John Adams famously remarked, I am nothing as vice president, but I may be everything, he overlooked a third possibility, a middle course in which contingency coexisted with significant involvement as a supporting player in the national drama. In any event, we can put pay to the curse of Aaron Burr, the overly ambitious running mate who thought he could make off with the top prize at the expense of Thomas Jefferson, and who condemned a century's worth of successors, vice presidents, to suffer the senatorial verbosity of which George Clinton, among others, complained. I said at the outset that Clinton had a point. Let me now prove it by bringing down the gavel, so to speak, uh, and thanking you for your attentiveness and inviting your questions. Comments? <laughs> Constructive criticisms. So you talked a little bit about the Naval Observatory and, and Betty and him touring. What, can you go a little bit more into depth about that whole process? And yeah, he, he was, you've got to remember, Gerald Ford was the original fiscal conservative. He was cheap. And um, he was cheap with the public's money um, and as well as his own. And he was appalled, not at the idea, actually it was Bob Griffin, his friend Bob Griffin. There had been talk about creating a vice presidential residence for years. In fact, the legend is that it, it could have happened in the 1920s. But Florence Harding, um, with characteristic waspishness, said that a hotel was good enough for those Coolidges. And so, um, of course, before long, those Coolidges had moved into the White House in place of Mrs. Harding. But in any event, uh, there had been talk for years. And then the idea came up, the, um, the Naval Observatory, the um, Admiral Zumwalt's residence um, was going to be temporarily vacant for renovation. And Griffin uh, filed legislation, which passed both houses, to take the house away from the Navy and turn it into a vice presidential residence. Uh, Mrs. Ford, to be perfectly honest with you, didn't really want to leave their home, their very modest split-level ranch house on Crown Drive in Alexandria. That was the house they built. That was the house you know, all their children knew. Um, the backyard swimming pool, uh, you know, and, uh, but you know, she would do her duty. They were prepared to go until Ford found out how much it was going to cost. And um, Jack Marsh, a, not a familiar name, in many ways, I would argue the conscience of the Ford administration and the key behind the scenes facilitator. Jack Marsh was the kind of guy, I was told, who'd walk into the Oval Office, you'd tell him the, the day's problem, someone's not getting along, you know, et cetera, et cetera. We've got a roadblock up on the hill. And Marsh would wander out, and you'd never hear about the problem again. But anyway, so it was <laughs> Jack Marsh was a guy who was delegated to go to the vice president then with all the, the, the notebooks about what it was going to cost. It was three phases of renovation, and the last being, you know, whatever you do when you buy a house. I mean, furnishings, um, china curtains, et cetera, et cetera. The things that he was supposed to be interested in that, uh, that night in August. Well, he looked at the, uh, at the cost. And I, I mean, today, it seems pretty modest. I mean, it, it totaled under, it was under a million dollars. But Ford was um, disbelieving and basically said, you, you go to Betty, tell her the deal's off. <laughs> he, he was not going to spend half a million public dollars to refurbish a house 
um, that he might or might never live in. Anyway, in the end, of course, it was Nelson Rockefeller who, uh, happy Rockefeller, took over. And uh, the Rockefellers furnished the house. They never lived there because he had a better house <laughs> on Fox Hall Road, uh, a 1790s farmhouse, which had been added on to considerably 26 acres of Northwest Washington. And um, in any event, so why, why, plus better security and more privacy. So why give that up? Anyway, but, but they, you know, they had, they finished the house and they had a series of receptions. They invited everyone in Washington to come see the house. Um, and, uh, and then again, it, it, but the first, first, the first vice president to live in the house was Walter Mondale. We have time for uh, one more question, and here we go. Bob Hendershot, Grand Rapids Community College. Thank you very much for your presentation. Sure. Towards the end, you invoked the idea of, of future historians. And this got me thinking about the Schopenhauer that history is always written wrong, so it always needs to be rewritten, and how objectivity is the noble dream. And, well, how to put this? Um, you commented on the enduring uh, debate about the possibility of a deal and a pardon. And as you are you know, the, the, the expert on Ford, I thought I'd ask you about the evolving story arc and what you think you know, is, is I am the emergent narrative that Ford's pardon of Nixon uh, shaped the presidency's relationship with the law to the point where we're still dealing with the ripple effects right. of it today. There's a word for that. It's called hindsight. And I'm not saying hindsight has no place in history. Don't get me wrong. We, we, we obviously, well, we're still debating Harry Truman's decision to drop the bomb. And, and, and no one really thought Harry Truman, um, given the circumstances into which he had been thrust, um, should have stopped and convened a seminar of, of scientific and constitutional scholars to contemplate the long-term possible implications of this decision. He had a war to win. And he thought, potentially, hundreds of thousands of lives, Japanese, by the way, as well as Americans, to save. Um, the, the other, what you, you mentioned the core, I mean, uh, the line about, you know, life is lived forward and history is assessed backward. You have to put yourself in Gerald Ford's shoes in August of 1974 to understand why he did what he did. You can judge historical figures, presidents, by any standard you want, including completely contemporary, but you can only understand presidents by immersing yourself in another time as, as credibly as possible with the papers that are crossing their desk with the advice that they're getting. Um, this was a man who literally could not allow himself to think until 48, uh, the last 48 hours that he would be president of the United States. Couldn't prepare for it, couldn't discuss the possibility even with his own wife. And suddenly, here he is. And every day, he is discovering things he didn't know. Um, lest we forget, the economy was headed south. Inflation worse than anything we've recently experienced. Um, a looming recession. Uh, lest we forget, we had not exited Vietnam entirely. Um, as, as Gerald Ford would experience to his grief in the spring of 1975. Um, relations with the Soviets were very delicate. Arms control talks were stalled. NATO was fraying badly. You had communist revolution in Portugal, um, communist parties in France and Italy who were knocking at the door. Uh, all of this, oh, and by the way, uh, second day in office, uh, he's, he's informed uh, that there's this haywire uh, 
scheme to retrieve a sunken Soviet submarine in the Pacific involving Howard Hughes creating something called the Glomar Explorer with the cover story that it was to discover manganese crystals at the bottom of the Pacific while a Soviet trawler is, you know, anyway, you, you get the picture. And day after day after day, he finds, he said, 25% of his time, some days more, being monopolized by Richard Nixon. Nixon's tapes, Nixon's papers, uh, and ultimately Nixon's legal prospects. Now, for whatever it is worth, Gerald Ford believed that if the process went forward, Nixon would be indicted, uh, tried, and convicted at least for obstruction of justice. And then it would obviously come, come back to him. Um, so all of this is going on, and he concluded quite independently, in my opinion, that um, he had to find a way to change the subject. The media were upset. This was the greatest story. Remember the, famously when, when Edward VIII abdicated and Mencken called it the greatest story since the resurrection? Well, this was a close second, certainly as far as the Washington Press Corps were concerned. Everyone was obsessed. The country was obsessed. Critically, Ford didn't do this without consulting. He secured through back channels uh, <laughs> um, Leon Jaworski, the special prosecutor, had a suite in the Hotel Jefferson, which happened to be the same hotel where Phil Buchan and his wife were staying, which facilitated backdoor channels between the trusted Phil Buchan, who had become White House counsel, and Jaworski. The president was assured that it would be at least one year and quite probably two years before Nixon could be brought to trial. The reason being pretrial publicity. Ford, in his own mind, reasoned a sequence of events ending in a Nixon conviction being overturned on precisely those grounds, pretrial publicity. In any event, knowing what he knew, knowing that the Nixon obsession would preoccupy the country for the next two years at a time when he was trying overnight to learn to be president, to address the economic problems the country had, uh, as well as a, a host of foreign policy crises. Um, that was what was going on in his head. Now, can he be criticized for not pausing and asking himself, you know, what might be the unintended consequences of this act? I suppose. And, and there are people today who, who, who do so. Uh, and I, I respect their judgment, um, you know, but to me, we don't elect our presidents for their clairvoyance. We elect them, among other things, for their character and for their willingness to make difficult decisions, even at the cost of re-election. And this was one of those decisions. And I think if there is a consensus about the pardon, it is that it is the single most significant factor in denying Ford a victory in 1976. We forget the, the, the change of 9,000 votes in two states would have had a different outcome in the Electoral College. So anyway, and I don't mean to sound like a defender. I think Ford was wrong, for whatever it's worth, in his timing. Um, and this is, Hartman, said, why now? You know, I think what he was thinking was, this was the beginning of September, two months away from the congressional elections. Gerald Ford had a 70% approval rating. He was finally the one great political asset that Republican candidates could count on. 
was he really going to risk throwing that all away along with not a Republican Congress, but cutting your losses? And Ford said, in effect, um, there would never be a good time. And he, he just, I think he just wanted to get it off his back. Now, that, it seems to me, you can legitimately criticize um, tactically. Um, I mean, that, I think you can, you know, for whatever it's worth, um, you could certainly come up, spin a different uh, scenario where Ford waited a couple months. Remember, Richard Nixon almost died at the end of October. If Nixon had, of course, Nixon, Ford couldn't know, but I mean, if Nixon, I mean, at that point, it would have been seen as a genuine act of mercy. And that's the other thing, very quickly, I will close, but the second mistake Ford made, and he realized after it was a mistake, was how this was presented to the American people and, and the rationale that was used. Because it was a Sunday morning, and one of the things I discovered that the people, people have never known, Phil Buchan, who was not convinced, by the way, of the wisdom of the pardon, brought his pastor from Grand Rapids, Duncan Little Fair, known by his critics as Duncan Little Faith, a very unorthodox uh, man of God, who nevertheless uh, counseled the pardon as an act of mercy. Well, the fact is, Ford told himself afterward he wasn't pardoning Nixon out of mercy. He was pardoning Nixon out of a very practical, pragmatic considerations that it was the only way to get Nixon off the front pages and to get the nation's attention back on all of the issues that, quite frankly, had been neglected for a year or more. And the impression was left by Buchan, who went out and talked to the press, that in fact this was first and foremost an act of of, of mercy. And the American people were not feeling very merciful the first week of September 1974. So I think Ford made it much worse than it had to be. And I think he, he, he could, his judgment, political judgment, certainly can be called into question. But the, the, the whole idea about, you know, 50 years later, do, do you really, really believe that Donald Trump would have behaved any differently because his shrewd sense of history, his keen awareness of events 50 years earlier limited his options as, as president? I doubt it. Thank you again. You bet. So this has been a, uh, a rather long haul. Uh, it has been a, a lot of work, and there are a lot of people uh, that we would like uh, to thank. First of all, uh, on behalf of the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library and Museum, as well as the National Archives and Records Administration. We all thank you uh, for attending uh, this Vice Presidency Conference over the last two days. I think we can all say that every single panel and keynote was absolutely fantastic. Uh, they, of course, will all be provided very shortly, within about a week or two, uh, on our Gerald R. Ford uh, Presidential Library uh, YouTube page if you want to rewatch them or if you want to send it to, uh, to a friend. Uh, I want to thank uh, quite a few people. First of all, I'd like to thank our great director here, Brooke Clement, for this was her idea to have this conference, put this conference on. I'd like to thank the Gerald R. Ford Foundation providing generous financial support for uh, this uh, vice presidential conference. I'd like to thank some of our, our staff, like Richard Weld, uh, Dr. Morel Luque, who put uh, not only uh, contributed to the uh, one of the panels today, but as well as uh, created uh, a fantastic uh, exhibit uh, upstairs. And again, today we are free. Today, uh, you please feel free to go upstairs, peruse the exhibit on the vice presidency. Uh, it it is quite quite good. Um,
as, as a testament to many of the vice presidential scholars, specifically Joe Goldstein, who really was thrilled uh, by, the, by the exhibit the other day, he told me himself. Um, and with that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, again, on behalf of the National Archives and Records Administration, Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library and Museum, we thank you very much. <laughs>